right, right up here on the front row, we have, uh, we have five candidates for baptism in this service. We had six, but one of them was not able to make it. So when I call your name, if you would just stand briefly, face the audience, and then sit down so they can put name and face together. All right? Madison Tatro, would you please stand? Isn't she cute? All right. I just love that. She's not wearing her glasses today, though. Rudy and Amanda Brasida, would you please stand up? Am I saying the last name close to correct? Okay, good job. Thank you. Brad Nelson. All right, Brad's part of our 8 o'clock service. Wait, Brad. All right, there we go. Uh, Glenn Matson, would you stand, please? Uh, wave, Glenn. There we go. So those are our five for this service. Not too many years ago, the new newspapers carried a story about a gentleman by the name of Al Johnson. He was a Kansas man who had repented of a sin and came to faith in Jesus Christ. What made his story so remarkable was not his conversion, because they don't have a habit of printing those in the newspaper. But what was significant that prompted them to put it in a newspaper is that because of his new faith in Jesus Christ... He walked into a police department and confessed to a bank robbery he had participated in when he was 19 years old. He did not realize, but the statute of limitations had expired on that, and so he wasn't going to be prosecuted. But because of his complete and radical change of heart, he not only confessed to his crime, but he also voluntarily repaid his share of the stolen money. That's repentance. That is a radical reconstruction of your heart. And that is what baptism is all about. It is reflecting, it is symbolizing this transformation that God, you are allowing God to do on the inside of you. We don't come become acceptable to God because we start behaving properly. We become acceptable to God when we tell him we can't behave properly. And then he comes to live in us. And by his presence in us, he demonstrates his life through us. And there is a change that works from the inside out. Some of Jesus' last words that are recorded in the Gospel of Matthew say this. Go and make disciples to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Have we reached the end of the age yet? No, because we're still walking. <laughs> we're still here taking nourishment. And so our challenge until the end is, is to still baptize men and women and boys and girls until Jesus comes back again. We're doing that today right here in Clovis, California. One of the things I'm going to miss, not going to Africa this coming February, but we'll get back to it in 2021, is the baptism I got to do in an, in an African village where I baptized anywhere from 10 to 20 on a given Sunday when we were there. But fulfilling the Great Commission baptizing disciples around the world. Peter, in his letter, chapter 3, verse 21, says baptism's important. That water baptism symbolizes that now saves you. It's not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Christ. Little Holly was about eight years old, and she had faithfully attended her baptism classes. Her mother, wanting to be sure that her daughter understood the significance of what she was about to do, said, Honey, what does baptism mean? Well, it isn't the water that makes us clean, she began, and that's a good start. Her mother was smiling and thought, Wow, my daughter gets it. And then her daughter said, It's not the water, Mom, it's the soap. Of all the decorations that we're going to be putting up at Christmas time, and all the decorations that we can put up in church, there is one that is most important, and it's an invisible one, because it takes place in our heart. The Holy Spirit changes us through the Word of God, and that is revealed through the reflections of baptism. Baptism is visible, and the life of Christ in us ought to become visible as well. And we are empowered to have a changed life through the repentance of our own life. Just like that bank robber. And unlike other Christmas decorations that we will take down, if you're like my wife, the day of Christmas, <laughs> repentance is something that all of us should leave up all year round. You all probably don't believe this, but sometimes as pastors, we can be susceptible to occasional mistakes. <laughs> or in my case, frequent mistakes. 
So it's no surprise that the story is told about the baptism of Zakin by the name of Saint by of Akin by Saint Patrick in the middle of the fifth century. True story. Sometime during the practice of the baptism, Saint Patrick leaned on his sharp pointed staff and inadvertently stabbed the king's foot. St. Patrick was totally unaware of this while it was happening. When the baptism was over, Patrick looked down at all the blood mixed with the water and realized what he had done, and he begged the king's forgiveness. Why did you suffer in pain? The saint asked the king. And the king shrugged and said, I thought it was part of the ritual. <laughs> I've got good news for you guys. I don't have a sharp pointed staff, and it is not part of the ritual. Erwin McManus, a pastor and an author, reminds us that Christianity is a dangerous faith. Even though I'm not going to stab you today, I want you to understand, knowing Jesus and professing that reality can be dangerous. McManus said, how could we ever think that Christian faith would be safe when its central metaphor is the instrument of death, a cross that's behind that screen? It's not a coincidence that baptism is a watery grave depicting death and resurrection. It is no less significant that the ongoing ordinance of the Lord's Supper is a reminder of death and sacrifice. How did we ever develop a safe theology from such a dangerous faith? So for the five of you sitting right here, this is going to be kind of like a wedding ceremony. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me a few words. You can do it together so nobody's singled out. But I want to make sure you believe what you say. I'll give you just a few words so it shouldn't be difficult. All right? Are you all ready? This is the day of declaration. I am a believer in Jesus Christ. I believe he is God the Son. Okay, you could say it slightly louder if you would like. Use your outside voice. He came as a man and died a death he did not deserve. So I could live a life I could never earn. I have confessed my sin and accepted his forgiveness. I declare that I am a child of God and that Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. On this day, you're being identified with Jesus Christ in this public baptism. Just as many of us in this room have invited Christ in our life and been baptized, I want all of us, if we agree with these next statements, to repeat these out loud on this day of identification. Because I have confessed my sin and acknowledged Christ as my Savior and Lord, I choose to forever be identified as a, as a Christian, not a religious person, a religious. but a believer and a follower of Jesus. A and of Jesus. I will not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen. Actually, you didn't have to say the amen, but <laughs> it sounded really good. <laughs> Ivan the Great was czar of all of Russia during the 15th century. He brought together the warring tribes and the country into one vast empire. It's now known as the Soviet Union. As a fighting man, Ivan was courageous. As a general, he was absolutely brilliant. He drove out the Tartars and established peace throughout the nation. However, Ivan was so busy waging his campaigns, he didn't have time to start a family. His friends and advisors, advisors were very concerned. They reminded him that if there was no heir to the throne, should anything happen to them, the union would be shattered into chaos. You must take a wife who can bear you a son. The busy soldier statesman said to them that he did not have time to search for a bride. They would find him a suitable one, and he would marry her. The counselors and advisors searched the capitals of Europe to find an appropriate wife for the greater czar. And find her they did. They reported to Ivan of the beautiful dark-eyed daughter of the king of Greece. She was young, she was brilliant, she was charming, and he agreed to marry her sight unseen. The king of Greece was delighted. It would align Greece in a favorable way with the emerging giant from the north, but there was one condition. He cannot marry my daughter unless he becomes a member of the Greek Orthodox Church. Ivan's response was, I will do it. 
A priest was dispatched to Moscow to instruct Ivan on the Orthodox doctrine. He was a quick student and learned the catechism in record time. Arrangements concluded. The Tsar made his way to Athens with 500 of his crack troops, his personal palace guard. He was to be baptized by immersion at the church, as was the custom. His soldiers, ever loyal, asked to be baptized right by his side. The patriarchs of the church assigned 500 priests to give the soldiers a one-on-one -on -one crash course on catechism. The soldiers, all 500 of them, were to be immersed along with Ivan in one mass baptism. Can you imagine? 501 priests, 500 and well, 500 soldiers and one czar all being baptized at the same, same time. What a sight. A thousand people all walking into the Mediterranean. The priests dressed in their black robes and tall hats, the official dress of the church. The soldiers in their battle uniforms with all their regalia, ribbons of valor, medals of courage, their weapons by their side. Suddenly there was a problem. The church prohibited professional soldiers from being members they would have to give up their commitment to bloodshed. They could not be soldiers and church members too. After a hasty meeting of diplomacy, the problem was solved quite simply. As the words were spoken and the priest began to baptize them, each soldier reached to his side, withdrew his sword, lifted it high over his head. Every part of that soldier was immersed except for his fighting arm and sword. That's a true story. The un- baptized arms. What a powerful picture of much of Christianity today. How sad. How many unbaptized arms or wills or talents or bank accounts or social activities are present in this sanctuary today? You five don't enter the water unless it's all of you that you surrender to Christ. And for the rest of us who've already professed faith and already been baptized, if you have unbaptized some part of your life, why don't you commit it back to him today? I'm going to ask the team in the back to show you a video. Get it ready. We are baptizing five, to, or, uh, actually eight today, but it's actually 16. Because you're going to see a video. Um, am I in the right order? Yes, I am. You're going to see a video of eight people who were baptized at man camp. Okay? Now, I gotta make a, uh, um, I've got to make a statement so that Mark doesn't end up in trouble. You are going to see two women baptized. At man, they did not get to go to man camp. Members of their family, husband or another member of their family was up there, knew they were being baptized, and wanted to be baptized at the same time. All right? Uh, so, if you see a couple of women, we don't want anybody getting after Mark. This is a disclaimer. Women were not allowed at man camp. They just came for the baptism. Okay? So, while we're watching this, those of you who are going to be baptized, if you would head out that door and make preparations, I'm going to be back here making mine. Don't anybody sneak a look in the back door till I open it. All right? I'll see you out there. Um, I'm going to ask Madison. Madison, come on down. No, it's actually, it's, Madison, don't worry, it is warm. Oh, feels good, doesn't it? Yeah. For those of you who were at our last baptism, um, the heater wasn't working, and it was ice cold. <clears throat> this is nice, huh? This is bath water. Uh, this is an extreme joy and delight. Every baptism is, but this one has some extra meaning to me. I've had the privilege of being connected to the Tatro family for close to 25 plus years, if my memory is correct. I've had the opportunity to do weddings and to do memorial services, and um, it is great fun to be able to share in Madison's baptism today. Madison, how old are you? Thirteen. Thirteen. She is a teenager. I wish I was thirteen. <laughs> She'd be my girlfriend. Oh. <laughs> uh, 
we have a little game we play just about every Sunday. She tries to play hard to get, and I play persistent. So, uh, but she has accepted Christ in her life, right? You did that at your home, huh, here a while back, not too long ago. And uh, she is a delightful young woman, and God has great plans for her, and it's our joy and delight to share in that today. And I love your tie-dye shirt. It makes me feel of my teenage years. Madison, because you have invited Jesus Christ to be your Savior and Lord, you have confessed your sins and professed your faith in Him. It is now my joy, my privilege to baptize you as my sister in God's family in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, Rudy and Amanda. Amanda's coming in first, and Rudy is following right behind her. Since they're married, we're going to let them get in here together. All right. Be careful here. Can't be slippery. Good job. All right. Rudy, man, I don't have as much history with you as I do with Madison, but it has been great fun, you all coming to church and getting acquainted with you a little bit on Sunday mornings, and I was so excited when I saw your name on the list. I think you have a few folks over there taking pictures, so if you want to flash them a Hallmark moment smile, all right, that'll be okay. Uh, have, have each of you invited Jesus Christ into your life? Okay. And uh, you profess him as your Lord and Savior? Yes. You understand what baptism means, and this is an identification that you'll never... Take your word back on him. Just like you're not going to take your word back from each other, you're not going to take your word back on him. You will love him for the rest of your days. Is that correct? Yeah. Terrific. Then let's do this. Step right up here, then Amanda. Close that step. Just like this. Amanda, because you've invited Jesus Christ to be your Savior and Lord, it is a joy and a delight for me to baptize you today. We are now part of God's family. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. first steps of obedience after our, our salvation is we, we do what we're doing right now. We get baptized. We let others know that Jesus Christ is important to us. So because of that faith that you've expressed in him, it is my joy and my privilege to baptize you. We are now brothers in God's family. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
12 years old. And so this is a treat. Glenn has been a believer for a long, long time. Uh, in fact, I was a little shocked. Uh, when he called and said I wanted to be baptized, I said, what? You have me he said, yes, Tim, I was baptized, but it's bothered me for years. He said, he and I share some common things. Our dads were pastors. My grandfather was a pastor. His great-grandfather was a pastor. Your grandmother would have been if they had a letter at that time. Uh, <laughs> um, so we share some things in common. And he said, but I asked my dad when I was just a boy to baptize me because everybody else was getting baptized but I really didn't have a relationship with Jesus. That came in his later teen years. And he said, that's bothered me all these years, and so if it's bothered me, I figured I ought to do something about it. And so today, he's doing something about it, and this is very special. His great-grandfather was my grandfather's father in the ministry. It is his great-grandfather who taught my grandfather how to preach and how to pastor. And so it has been my joy and delight for us to be friends all these years. My pleasure. All right, so... You're a Christian, right, Glenn? Yes, I am. <laughs> You've known Jesus for how many years? Um, since I was 13. 13 years old. And I'm not going to tell him how old you are now. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, he's one of the few people in church that's older than my sister. Uh, <laughs> Glenn, because of your profession of faith in Jesus Christ several years ago, it is my joy on this day to celebrate that moment in time. I baptize you as my brother in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, if that doesn't put you in the mood to worship, I don't know what will. So why don't you lift your voices and your hearts together with the team as they come back up and lead us in worship. Any problems worshiping? I already preached half the sermon. Okay? You Are you part of a church? You can say, oh yeah, I got a baptism certificate. That's why I almost shudder when I use the word symbol. But just as I rarely ever take this symbol off of my finger, though I've lost three of them. <laughs> it's not because I took it off, all right? It flew off. This means something. And what we did today means something. And so just a, a brief refresher course as we wrap things up today. William P. Barker tells of a machinist at Ford Motor Company in Detroit many decades ago who became a Christian. He responded to the invitation for salvation and the following Sunday he was baptized. As the presence of God in him began renewing this man from the inside out, he became convicted of his need to make restitution of parts and tools that he had stolen from the company prior to becoming a Christian. So the next morning, he brought all the tools and the parts back to his employer, and he explained how he had just been baptized, and he asked for the foreman's forgiveness. See, you're hearing two stories today of a radical, radical transformation of heart. Yes, God had already forgiven their sins. Did they ever need to mention those things again? No, they didn't. But this radical change in their life prompted them to say, my life will be different. I will do things differently from now on. And things that I could make up for in my past, I will. Salvation is not just a fire insurance policy that we have so that when we die, we don't go to hell, but we go to heaven. Salvation is about getting the God of heaven out of heaven and into us until that moment that we do get to go to heaven. And so this gentleman who confessed to what he had done at work, for this foreman, it was such an amazing turn of events that he thought the owner of the company, Mr. Ford himself, should know about it. Mr. Ford was visiting a plant in Europe at the time, and he was cabled the details of this matter, and he was asked to respond, what should we do? Mr. Ford immediately returned to cable with his decision, dam up the Detroit River and baptize the entire city. 
I think that's pretty dang good advice. We need to dam up every river in this country and get everybody saved. That would change this country around, and this country needs it. The act of baptism, which is being immersed in water after receiving salvation, is a very first initial step in the Christian life. In Matthew chapter 3, we see Jesus himself as he launches his public ministry, coming to his own cousin, John the Baptist, in order to be baptized, and the scripture says, to fulfill all righteousness. He then went on to establish baptism as an eternal forever ordinance of his church, calling every believer to follow in his footsteps. The closing words of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, beginning at verse 19, goes like this. And Jesus came and spoke to them. This is not a disciple or a writer of the New Testament. This is Jesus himself. It's letters in red in your Bible. Jesus came and spoke to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Today, we got to participate in fulfilling the command of God in baptizing those who've come to know Jesus. Last Sunday, we had a chance to highlight carrying out the uttermost parts of the world as 1040i came and shared with us about their mission in Ivory Coast, Africa. In our modernized comfort zone Christianity, sad to say, we tend to take God's command, I think, far too lightly. Chuck Colson pointed this out in one of his books when he said, most Westerners take baptism for granted. But for many in the world, this act of baptism requires courage. In countries like Nepal, it meant imprisonment. For the Soviets or the Chinese or Eastern Bloc believers, it is like signing their own death warrant. A wedding ring is the outward sign of marriage. A military uniform was an outward sign that a person belongs to either the Marines or the Army or the Air Force or the Coast Guard or who'd I leave out? Navy. Sorry, Navy boys. Similarly, water baptism is a symbol designed by God to identify us as a disciple of Jesus Christ, one who follows him. When we are saved... Galatians chapter 3 verse 27 says we are spiritually baptized into Christ. Before we ever step foot in water, we by the presence of the Spirit coming to live within us at the moment we invite Christ to be our Savior, we are spiritually baptized to Christ and in his body and into his church. Baptism in water is an outward representation of these inward realities. In biblical symbolism, water represents inner cleansing. You'll find that in Ephesians 5 and Hebrews 10. And John says in chapter 3, verse 5, it's a picture of spiritual rebirth. Both are central themes of baptism. Water baptism is, in essence, I don't know if you ever thought about it like this, it's a funeral. And it's your funeral. It's an act of faith in which we testify both to God, who is now our Father and Savior, and to the world, that the person we were before salvation is now dead and buried under the water. We are now raised, coming out of the water in the, as a new creation in Christ. This is beautifully illustrated in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of his Father, even so, you and I should walk in the newness of life. Are you walking different as a believer than you did before? If you are not, I can't be the judge, but if you are not, you need to have a serious conversation with God to see if you really are a believer. Because there will be a difference in the way in which we make decisions and the kind of decisions that we make. Colossians 2, 12, buried with him in baptism. We are also risen with him through faith, through the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. Baptism, following a person's salvation. They didn't see it as something to be delayed very long or put off. Man, we could look at some of the conversions in the New Testament. Uh, there are two that are back to back. And um, let's see here, in Acts, I believe it's chapter 8 and 9. Uh, let me see. Yeah, Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 9. We have Philip and the Ethiopian. And uh, we have Saul of Tarsus and Ananias. Um, I love the story of Philip and the Ethiopian. Philip was a disciple of Jesus Christ. And uh, Philip is in the heart of Jerusalem. 
and revival has broke out all over Jerusalem. The scripture says people are being added to the church every single day. It's just an explosion going on. It's exciting. And God tells Philip, hey, I want you to leave Jerusalem and I want you to go out into the wilderness, to the desert. There's an Ethiopian out there. I want you to tell him about me. But the action's here. See, the Ethiopian had come to Jerusalem and whoever he'd hung out with in Jerusalem didn't tell him about Jesus. He was hunting for him, but he didn't find him. And so he's heading back home, heading back to his own country, and he's very discontent. And so God says, this, this, is, this is why God pursues you to your very last breath. He doesn't force you, but he pursues you. He knew the heart of this Ethiopian. This Ethiopian wanted to find him. He couldn't find him for some reason in the streets of Jerusalem that he had walked down, but he's back out in the desert, nobody around. And God says, Philip, go out in the middle of nowhere. There's a guy I got set up for you. Philip goes. He walks up to him, and the Ethiopian's reading the Old Testament, reading Isaiah. And Philip says, it might be tough to understand something you're reading unless somebody explains it to you. And he said, can you explain it to me? And he said, I think I can. You see, the passage you're reading is an Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah who just died and rose again from the dead. And he told him about Jesus. And right there, the Ethiopian got saved. Now, the Ethiopian had seen enough in Jerusalem to know that when you got saved, when you invited Jesus in your life, you're supposed to be baptized. He saw that probably taking place. And so he looked over at Philip after he prayed to receive Jesus, sitting there in the chariot, all right? Out in the middle of nowhere, there was a little pool of water. Ethiopian looks at Philip, and he looks at the pool of water, he looks at Philip, and he said, hey, there's water. Any reason I can't be baptized? Nope. Boom. Baptize him right there in the desert. Didn't have to wait a long time. Didn't have to go to a catechism class. Didn't have to go to a believer's or church membership class. You saved? Yes. Let's get baptized. Great. Let's do it. The next chapter, it's about Saul, who wrote most of the New Testament once he became Paul. Either getting saved on the road to Damascus to a street called Straight, and Ananias, who was a leader in the church, very active leader in the church. God comes to Ananias, Ananias, I want you to go see Saul. I need you to finish up some work in him. And Ananias said, that guy kills Christians. I don't want to go share faith with him. Who needed it more than Saul? Ananias finally agrees to go, and the scales fall off of Saul's eyes, both physically and spiritually. He is saved, and the scripture says Ananias baptized him. Don't have to wait long. You just got to be saved in order to do it. A living faith will produce an obedient heart. And baptism is one of the first steps of obedience we can show when we become a Christian. Baptism is an illustration of what it means for you and I to be in Christ. We've been talking about that in recent weeks out of the book of Philippians. Being placed into Christ when we are saved is like being placed into water, completely covered. We are not seen except through, none of y'all can see those people I baptize, and the only way I see them is through the water. I don't see them straight on. And when God the Father looks at us, he doesn't look at us straight on. He sees us through the image of his son, Jesus Christ. It's like if I had my Bible up here, which I meant to, and I took this pen and I placed it inside my Bible you would not see my pen. If that Bible was buried with me when I die, that pen would be buried right along with the Bible. When I open up the pages of that book, you would see the pen in the context of being inside the book. Just like that, you and I cannot be seen by God except through Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ so that it's not I, but Christ who lives in me. And so the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave himself for me. Baptism under the water. Baptism in Christ. This decision to become a Christian is not to be made on feelings or emotions. You and I are to investigate the facts of who Jesus is, and with an exercise of reasonable faith, we are to become believers in him. For it is by faith the love of God has been accepted. It is by faith the hope of eternal life has been received. It is by faith the joy of Christ has been shared. It is by faith. Listen to this one. This is the one most of us get caught up on. It is by faith the fear of death has been abolished. That's who we are when we become a Christian. 
Not by our works. We can't earn it. We can't be good enough to ever deserve it. We can't work hard enough to acquire it on our own. And we certainly cannot be wealthy enough to buy our way in by faith in who Jesus is and him alone. Let me close. Paul Harvey wrote in Guide Post magazine about his own baptism. Two-thirds of you in here know who Paul Harvey is. Anybody under 40 probably has no clue, all right? Do you guys know who Paul Harvey is? Ask your parents, okay? Maybe they'll play a program for you, a rerun. I miss Paul Harvey on the radio. Paul Harvey wrote in Guidepost Magazine about his own personal baptism. He said that even though he had received almost every reward for his broadcasting ability, he still felt empty inside. One summer, he and his wife were vacationing in a place called Cave Creek, Arizona. It was a Sunday morning, and they decided to go to church. So they went to this little church they found, and when they got inside, only 12 people, including the pastor, were present. Paul said, I already believed in Jesus. I had never gone forward in a church service. One night, he said, I'd prayed in my hotel room, and I'd asked Christ to come into my heart. But he said, I still felt there was something missing. He said that the preacher got up and announced that his sermon was going to be about baptism today. Paul Harvey said, I yawned. But as he started talking about it, I found myself interested. He talked about the meaning and how it symbolized the complete surrender of one's life to Christ and how there was nothing really magic in the water, but there was this cleansing inside that took place when you yielded yourself to Jesus. He went on to say, finally... When it came to the end of the sermon, the preacher said, if any of you have not been baptized in this way, I invite you to come forward and join me right here at the pulpit. Paul Harvey said, to my surprise, in front of that crowd of 12, I found myself going forward. The preacher had said nothing magic in water, yet as I descended into the depths of the baptistry that day and rose up out of it, I knew something in my life had changed a cleansing inside. No longer there seemed to be two uncertain contradictory Paul Harveys. Just one immensely happy one. I felt the fulfilling surge of the Spirit working in my life. Paul Harvey wrapped up the article with this statement. The change this simple act made in my life is so immense as to be indescribable. Since totally yielding myself in baptism, my heart can't stop singing. Perhaps because baptism is such a public act and because one's dignity gets as drenched as one's body, I discovered a new unself consciousness in talking about my beliefs. You witnessed five people being baptized this morning. You witnessed eight others at man camp being baptized today. You've heard what it means and represents. It's a picture of. Maybe some of you are like Paul Harvey. It's time for you to take the next step. Maybe some of you are like a pre-motel room Paul Harvey. You've never invited Christ in your life. Or maybe... You are like the soldiers of Ivan. There's a part of your life that is uncommitted to Christ. Then why not in this closing prayer take care of it? And here's the here's deal I'll make with you. If you accept Christ today, you've never accepted before, and you want to be baptized today, hang out for the 11 o'clock service. We'll send you home wet. You don't need to change your clothes. We'll just give you, a, we'll get, we'll give you something to put over your car seat. And you just go home and change your clothes. All right? It'll be just, you won't even have to stay for the sermon again. All right? You can just go right home right afterwards. But we'd be honored to do that. Why don't you invite Christ in your life if you haven't? Why don't you commit to Christ if there's a part of your life you've been holding in reserve? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the incredible celebration of baptism today. What a joy to share with these men and women and young people in this new step in their life. May they never forget it. And Father, just as the day of their salvation was a turning point in their lives, may this day of their baptism be a a, a Gilgal moment, a day that they never want to forget. 
they'll always remember what you have done for them and what you are still prepared to do in them. Thank you for hearing our prayers. And Lord, if there's a man or a woman, a boy or a girl who today didn't know why they were coming and thought, oh man, baptism. And yet you've spoken to their heart. Thank you for listening to the prayers. They invite you to become their Savior and Lord. Thank you for others who are shoring up some uh, weak foundations in their life. Thank you that you hear every one of our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a good afternoon.